Okay then, hello, and welcome to my presentation, Exploiting Buffer Overflows on RISC-V. Um, so maybe some words about um, me. I'm, yeah, Christina Kress. I'm working as an embedded um, systems developer. Um, I studied electrical engineering at TU Berlin, and now I'm living in France and Nice. And um, in my university, I played IT security CTFs, and that's how I got interested in security. And that's what this talk will be about, partly. So that's what I will be covering. Um, after the introduction, I will give you an architectural overview over the architecture, RISC-V. I will tell you what the differences um, to ARM and x86 are. Um, and then we will directly dive into hands-on examples, how to um, exploit a buffer overflow, how to write your own trial code for um, Brisk 5 and how to perform red to libc. And I hope all those words will make more sense to you once this presentation is over. So what is Risk 5 um, Risk 5 is an ISA, an instruction set architecture. Um, it was started 2010 at the University of California in Berkeley, but since then it has seen many contributions. And um, in, since 2018, we have boards out there in hardware because before it was just um, software written, a program which you could flash onto your FPGA to simulate an, a CPU. But yeah, nowadays we have hardware. And since March 2019, the version 2.2 is stable of this instruction set architecture and you can start using it in your software development project. And um, to see how important this project actually is, you can see it by which companies joined the Risk Five uh, Foundation, which are, for example, Google, NXP, Nvidia, Qualcomm, Samsung. Um, and so the advantage of Risk Five um, is that it's released under a permissive open source license, which means that anyone, you, me, and university can implement his own Risk Five architecture without needing to pay any royalties. So yeah, what is what is an ISA actually? Is whatever your CPU hardware understands. So it defines um, memory and registers. It defines logic ports which do the calculations between the registers. Um, yeah, it's basically like the machine language, um, which describes what your CPU is capable of carrying out. And so what your CPU actually understands is binary data, um, and that's what um, but in order to make it easier for us programmers, there's the assembly and mnemonic language, which we see here. For example, this one means um, add the immediate 559 to whatever is stored in the register A5 and store it back into A5. Um, but what the CPU actually sees is just binary data, um, which means the same. Um, and so why do we care that there is an open hardware implementation now? Why do we want to have an open hardware processor or CPU? Um, yeah, for one, it's the license fees I manage nowadays. For example, if you want to implement your own ARM architecture, you would need to pay royalty fees to ARM. Or um, so if, for example, a startup wants to make a quick prototype or a university wants to use an architecture to teach it to the students. Um, there was nothing on the market until now. Um, so that's where Risk Five comes, for example, into play. And the whole idea uh, behind Risk Five is also to democratize um, the process. So um, you have documentation to the chip, and anybody can join the Risk Five Foundation and discuss and um, find a consensus how what kind of features to include in the architecture and which not. Um, and anybody can join, which means uh, be it a company or an individual. Um, the project was designed um, to take all good ideas of architectures we have now in place and fix their shortcomings. So they want to be performant on microcontrollers, which usually have um, are low on memory and have a low power consumption, as well on 64-bit processors. Um, so how did I play around with the architecture? One possibility would have been to yeah, take one of the boards, um, but I thought it would be easier to just emulate it in QMO. So I downloaded um, the image from the Pedro web website and launched it, and ready I had um, a usable RISC-V um, 
um, system with tool chains where I had the build libc, the um, a GDB, which I didn't need to try to cross compile or anything. But the problem is it's quite resource hungry. So it, on my system, for example, it needs three minutes to start up. So it's not really optimized yet. But at least you have everything in place. You can just directly start hacking. Um, so what is the Rescribe architecture? Um, it's a re reduced instruction set computer, which means um, you have um, small instructions which are not complex, but just do one um, task. Intel, for example, has um, push and pop operations to put things on a stack and take things from a stack. Um, RISC-V doesn't have that. You need to address your stack um, relative to your memory. Um, your program counter cannot be directly written. Instead, you have to play around with the return stack, which is usually put on a stack, and you have to override that. Furthermore, it's little endian, which means the lit, uh, least significant byte comes first and the most significant uh, byte comes last in the memory. So if you want to write your exploit later, you need to kind of shift around the bytes and we will see that later. So RISC-5 um, has a modular approach, which means um, um, there's only one minimal instruction set which is obligatory to implement and everything is uh, everything besides that is optional. The minimal instruction set has jumps, branches, uh, logical operations, or add and sub subtract operations. But you can also add uh, multiplications on integers, um, floating point operations, um, vector operations. You can add a 64-bit instruction set on top of that. And um, a 128-bit instruction um, size no, um, instruction set is in the works right now. And also you can use compressed instructions, which uh, the um, compressed in extension uses two bytes for one instruction instead of four. So what else are the differences between architectures? So on RISC-V as well as on ARM, you would have, um, you can use your um, registers A0 to A7 to pass functions to uh, parameters to a function. In x86, 32-bit, uh, it used to be that you have to put everything on the stack, but um, that's not true for the 64-bit uh, version right now anymore. Um, RISC and ARM have many more general purpose registers. They have 32 of them, while x86, 64-bit, um, has only 16. Um, and the reason for that is on x86, most of the instructions have access to memory, so you can perform your add or sub directly on a memory address, whereas on ARM and RISC-V, you first need to load the value from memory into a register, then perform whatever operation you want to perform, and then put it back um, into memory. Um, so, yeah, RISC-V is therefore called a load store architecture, while x86 is a, is a register memory architecture. Then RISC-V um, instructions are, um, or memory access is byte aligned, while instruction ac uh, access to instructions in memory is word aligned, um, which means every time you fetch an instruction, you always fetch four bytes, unless you are using the compressed instructions, which is only, um, which support two byte instructions. Mm. And RISC-V got inspired by many successful CPUs which are already on the market, like Spark and um, PowerPC or MIPS or ARM. And all of them has, have a fixed uh, width instruction set, while, for example, Intel is known to have um, variable size instructions which are harder to schedule or harder to fetch and decode in the CPU. And um, all those CPUs have a vast number of registers so that you, do, you need less um, accesses to RAM, and um, accessing a register takes much less time um, than accessing a value in RAM, for example. And you have a very simple um, addressing mode. So this is the important registers we will be looking at later in our assembler code. For example, we have the zero register, which is basically only zero. Uh, which is useful 
in programming in general. For example, sometimes you want to compare uh, whether a pointer is null or whether a value is zero, and you already have this register at hand. While um, in other um, architectures, you would need to clear this register first before you can use it for comparison. And furthermore, having the zero register also reduces the instruction set because you can use it for negation. So instead of having a negation instruction, you would just calculate x0, which is always 0, minus x1, which contains your value, and you have the new value. Then RA is, yeah, contains the return address. Um, SP is the stack pointer. Then S0 is the frame pointer, um, which you will find later in the assembler code. And um, in A0 and A to A7, as I said, you pass the function arguments. And the return value of your function you can find after the execution of your function in uh, A0 to A1. Um, so I'm showing you the function pro and epilog um, on RISC-V. Uh, because you will see this pattern basically later in assembler code and might be easier to understand. So on the right side we see SD. SD stands for um, store double, which means it takes the value which is in RA and store, stores it at the memory address um, stack pointer plus 8. And LD is load double, which does the inverse. It stores whatever, um, or it loads whatever is located at um, stack pointer plus 8 into register RA. And um, so a typical prolog and epilog is whatever happens or whatever the compiler puts without you knowing that. Like you write your little main function and the compiler takes care of constructing e and destructing the stack. Um, which means he um, basically makes um, space on the stack for um, 16 bytes and then he stores the return address and the frame pointer from the previous um, function onto the stack. And whenever the function, like here's the normal function operation, and then you have the compiler has to deconst, or the code has to destruct the stack which he built up. So he stores back the return address and the frame pointer and um, yeah, destructs the stack. And um, jumps to this address which was yeah, stored before. So that's how it looks like on the buffer. Um, it says that this is your stack, and um, stack grows downwards, whereas um, address space uh, grows up upwards. So basically, you have a lower address here, for example, 0x00, and here the bigger address, 0xfffff. And so what happens if you have local variables? They are basically just stored after um, your, the save frame pointer. So if you have a local variable and int a, which is 5, you store it here, and b, uh, you store it afterwards on your stack. And maybe at this point you can, if you have a function like memcopy or string copy, it will still start from the lower address and will override to the upper address. And I guess at this point you can imagine how a buffer overflow can override your return address, which we will use later. So, for me, um, hacking is like basically you're searching some blocks of Lego or Duplo, and you build up your um, tower to create an exploit, and that's what we are going to do. We are going to search for um, stones to build up our tower. Let's start with a buffer overflow. So, for example, we have this function, um, which is yeah, vulnerable to buffer overflow, because you have um, a buffer of 8 bytes, and you're not checking the size of the buffer, you're just overwriting whatever was passed to a function in argv. And then let's assume you have this magic function, give shell, which just opens a shell for you and you can do whatever operation you want to do afterwards. Um, so what we want to do um, is use a buffer overflow to overwrite the return address of the usual function with our give shell function which gives us all the writes. And so basically after the buffer overflow, we don't care what is in the buffer. Um, we want to put uh, any valid address into the safe frame pointer, or it depends, sometimes we don't care. And we just want to be sure that in this address, um, 
on the stack, we have the gift shell address later. Um, so how do we go about, how do we approach this problem? So first of all, we have to find the address of grab shell and we can use object dump minus um, decode for that. So we have our address and then we just play around with GDB. So we pass some input into the, our program and see where it crashes. So in our case, it crashes at this address and for those who have played around with hex a lot, that is basically hex byte um, 0x41 is basically just A in hex. And you wonder why uh, why this one is a 40 instead of a 41. Um, as I said, risk 5 access to instructions is always at least um, two byte aligned or half word aligned. So that's why you can never have a one here. So next step would just be to replace uh, whatever is here, all those A's, with the address we found we find before. And that's what we do. And as I said, uh, risk five is a little endian architecture, which means you have to put uh, the least significant byte, in our case, 0x0, um, C0, zero first, and then the rest of the bytes. And uh, you see that uh, shell is spawned, and you can just do cat uh, etc pass vg, for example, this point. Yeah. And then you just have to double check that it works on your local system as well, outside of GDB. So, but what do we do if we, have n we don't have this magical gif shell function? What do we do to get a shell in this case? Um, in that case, you can write shell code. What is shell code? Shell code is some hex bytes you can pass to the CPU, which will spawn a shell for you. It will basically do the equivalent of um, system with um, the string bin is h in it or something. And normally for known architectures, you can download most of your shell code um, from Shellstorm, a website. Um, but since there's Kive as a new architecture, we have to do it by hand this time. So yeah, so this is the basic idea. Um, you find some executable area uh, in your memory, like the stack or the heap. Sometimes you have to leak the address, but in our example, to make it easy, the program will just give us the address. And um, then you write some assembler code, put your shell code into your buffer, overwrite um, the return address and jump there directly. So this is, that's our um, vulnerable function in this case. Again, we have a buffer, uh, which in this case is 128 byte big. And that's approximately, that's the place, the space we have to put our shell code. It can be up to 128 byte in size. And again, we have a string copy, which does not check um, for any um, size of your buffer and just overwrites whatever it finds. And again, we call it with the argv1 argument, so whatever is passed to your program. And so how do we go about? Um, we can, for example, yeah, start um, and take execv. And execve will execute any program you pass as the first argument as a string. And we will pass here the string bin sh. And yeah, about those arguments, we basically don't care. So first we have to find out, uh, so execve is a syscall. So we have to find out the syscall number. And for that, we can either look into the header and see, okay, that's um, syscall number 221. Or we can again um, look at um, libc and see um, how, how this um, function is called, and um, libc will just load the number 221 into the register A7, which is designated as the syscall um, number register, and then call the instruction ecall. So, yeah, so that's what we basically want to do. We want to pass um, Windows H to exec B, and uh, the other arguments we don't care, just null. So then my idea was um, to make life easier. I will not start from scratch um, writing assembler code. Instead, I will just implement a C function, compile it, and see what it does already. Um, so this is my C function, and this is the resulting shell code. And as, I, as you can see, that, that's basically the prologue and the, well, we don't have an epilogue in this case because we don't care what happens the stack afterwards, but we see the prologue we saw in the beginning. But um, the problem now is, um, ah, 
Yeah, um, but in that compiled function is using the PLT, the procedural language table, which is a mechanism where um, a program can, can find dynamically where libc functions are located. So basically it's like a trampoline. It goes to a place, searches for the address of the real exec v and jumps there later. And yeah, so instead of uh, going uh, around circles, we can just directly put um, th whatever the exec ve function does in there um, and have our resulting shell code. Yeah, then you compile it and you execute it and um, you double check that it works. But at this point, you have a problem because you have null bytes. And you know what happens with string copy if you um, pass something which has null bytes? It stops copying, exactly. So you wa don't want to have uh, any null bytes in your shell code because you will not copy the whole shell code then. So after having this base of a shell code, you want to remove all the null bytes. And uh, how can you do that? Yeah, for example, um, in the original version, it uh, used a power of um, two num number in order to adjust um, the stack, you can use uh, an odd number, let's say, in the base2 system in order to have a function which doesn't uh, use null bytes. And then you ha later have to adjust the offsets um, when you are referencing S0 as well. But um, Then here, for example, we are loading um, the immediate value 0x687 um, into our um, register A5. And instead of um, doing that, we can take a larger byte, uh, a larger number to remove null bytes, and then we have to account for the offset we created by doing more operations, which makes our shell code bigger, but at least we removed um, the null bytes. And then the last problem we have is the echo instruction, and we have to perform it um, as is. So in order to remove that, in our case, we are lucky because we have a writable stack as well. So basically, with the shell code, we are creating exactly this combination of numbers and putting it on the stack, and then we are jumping there. But it only works if your stack is writable. So um, what we see here is exactly the shell code we just created. And um, that's exactly what we want to pa pass into our buffer. Yeah, so you find it here again, same shell code. And um, so we overwrite um, the buffer with the shell code and then the rest of the buffer size we fill up with A's because we don't care. This is where the frame pointer would be located and this is the address we want to jump to. Because luckily our main program just gave us the address where the buffer is located, where our shell code starts. So we can just um, jump there and we are greeted from our um, shell here. And so, but what happens if our stack or heap is not executable? Because that's what a program normally is, right? You don't want anybody to execute code on your um, stack. Then you can perform read to, uh, read to libc, um, which is a technique of ROP or re return oriented programming. So yeah, let's assume that's our vulnerable program and um, it just reads in uh, whatever it finds in the file um, we pass over fd. And um, yeah, that's it. And our stack is not executable. We can try to perform ROP now. And uh, ROP means you basically search, you know what libc version is running on your system. So you know what um, possible assembly instructions you have in this uh, libc. And you're searching for um, assembly instructions which do something, do something, and then do red. Uh, in the best case, it loads a value from the stack in the registers you need, and then it does a return. And you basically chain those so-called uh, ROP gadgets one after another, um, so that you have the execution of the program you want to, have to execute. So for example, in our case, we want to execute um, the function system, which again, we pass uh, the string bin is h. Um, so yeah, first we have to find our ROP gadget. Again, we use object dump uh, minus decode for that. We grab around and um, 
out of the 1,000 gadgets, I found this one is nice because um, what we want to have after our buffer overflow is um, having the address of um, system in our um, register RA, the return address register. We want to have the, the address of um, the string bin is h in A0, which happens here. And the other two, we basically don't care. And we want to overwrite um, our return address on the stack with um, that one plus the offset wherever libc is mapped. So um, next step is we have to find out um, where the address of um, system is actually. We uh, use object dump for that again. Um, and then there's uh, the Python script which will generate um, the file with the exploit in it. Um, so we fill the buffer with ace because we don't care. This is the frame pointer again. And this is the um, gadget address we found. So the shell code I showed you, which basically initializes uh, the return address and a zero for us. And then um, on the stack further, you find um, the address of the string, bin is h. Um, yeah, obviously you need to have address um, space layout randomization disabled at this point, because otherwise your address will change all the time. Um, and um, then, yeah, the address of system in the buffer. And so this is the uh, generated, that's the uh, file called exploit generated by Python code, which is read in our program into the buffer. So we see um, this is the A's, for example, the B's, and um, the addresses, yeah, in the code as well. So we just pass it to our uh, function vol, and it opens a shell for us. And actually, um, I used, like normally, if you want to try out your exploit, in this case, in GDB. Uh, the problem is that GDB puts um, environment variables into your stack. Like, um, environment variables are located on the stack, so it will move around where your buffer is located in the end. So in order to um, facilitate that, you can either remove it by hand, or you use this fancy script called fixend, which you can get from GitHub, and um, it will adjust um, your stack for you. Yeah, that's basically it. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free, but otherwise I'm giving away some um, RISC-V boards and hardware. Um, if you have some fancy project, come talk to me and I will hand you a board and maybe tweet about what you want to do to motivate you more. That's all. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. Um, you said earlier that um, we have 32 general purpose registers, but only uh, 0 to 7 is used for, uh, for argument. <coughs> yeah. Oh. The rest you pass oh, on you, the stack. Okay. Um, you said earlier that we have 32 general purpose registers, but only uh, 0 to 7 is used to pass uh, arguments and, and return values. So I, I was wondering uh, what happened with the rest of them. Yeah, the other is, for example, the null register, or the return address register, or a frame pointer. Um, yeah, so basically they are used, but they are not used from argument passing or temporary registers where you just store values but you don't, they are not defined as uh, passing to function registers, yeah. There was another question, I think. No? Hello, why? Uh, uh, I have some questions because uh, uh, the the shear the shear uh, mm -hmm. point or we we say the function you call the when you return that is the 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 code you can access in your Linux uh, uh, OS. Wait, uh, which page is it? Do you I know? I think everyone like some some shear you can return and. Uh, 
create a shell shell command uh, console. Uh, maybe you say stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Yes, you. After you uh, run this program, you will um, just uh, run the vulnerable function. Yeah. And uh, this function is uh, the code. The code you can access, or the memory you can access, or uh, because uh, OS or uh, Linux have some memory MMU, yeah. that will limit you access the the page you you want to. But you put it on the stack. So basically, um, you can access buff, right? So you can also access buff plus 12 or buff plus 42. Okay, that, that page you can access. You, yeah. you have the authority to ac access that page. All, all the reads and writes and uh, executions I did, um, you have the authority to write at least. Uh, and it's, it is example to execute as well. Uh, okay. Because you, if you are in kernel space, that you can access it. But this uh, one is not in kernel space. This one is, for example... User space. But, I mean, the same techniques apply in kernel space. You're just accessing what you can use in your program as well. You're not... You're in your thread. Mm -hmm. You're not looking at thread 2 or 3, which does something different. You're in your address space, basically. Also, if I have one, one function uh, in my main app uh, application and uh, another one, the other another users uh, write their application. Then you don't. So I cannot. Uh, you can. You, it would be much more complicated. Okay. This one basically targets one program. One which program you that I yeah. can access the yeah. the full memory. The easy examples. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's Thank not you. the complicated examples oh. where you have to access yeah, other yeah. users. Hello, I have a question about that uh, uh, about our ROP attack. I think that mm -hmm. uh, uh, you have a fixed event, uh, hey, fixed environment to the shell script. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that may be the ASLR disabled. Uh, yeah, for all those examples, basically ASLR is disabled because, uh, I mean, otherwise you have to run it 1,000 times and might do the same. Yeah. And uh, what is the effort to, uh, for you to find that uh, gadget? Um, for normal architectures, you have actually programs. Like for ARM or uh, x86, you can call Rob Gadget or um, there are P uh, Python modules which okay, find Okay, you have you. a tool, right? To do but that. yeah, since that one is not, it will be implemented, I think, in the next month. But. <laughs> <laughs> But for now, I just use grep. <laughs> okay, okay. And uh, uh, have you compiled uh, uh, the, I mean, the same application that uh, compiled for both uh, by uh, on the risk of file and that uh, on ARM? Uh, any code size change? Then? Any? I mean, that code size change difference compared with. Uh, That's uh, uh, in any case, you have a different architecture. You have different instructions. You have different code size. Yeah, I mean, uh, which one is a smaller? Depends. I mean, my shellcode is not very sophisticatedly uh -huh. written, so you can make it smaller. I think you can just put it in 32 byte or something. Depends on how much time you want to dedicate to write your shellcode. But um, actually, Risk Five and ARM are quite similar uh -huh. in terms of instruction set, in terms of philosophy. Um, most techniques you can apply on ARM. You can also apply on Risk Five nowadays. Okay. And uh, so, uh, actually, you... Um, and also, in comp um, like, if you're asking about novel programs, it depends highly on your compiler, how well he can optimize for the platform. Yeah, uh, you mean uh, for GCC, they have optimized on the... Uh, yeah, I don't know how good their optimization for RISC-5 is, okay. for and, example. And uh, uh, can you go back to the, um, the, the general register compiled, uh, the slides, uh, which, which is differencing the arc? Yeah. Um, Yep, yeah, there. Yeah. That or uh, the previous? The next one. Yeah. Uh, uh, was uh, everything uh, compared with ARM that, like the banked register, is the same in the risk of file design? Say again? Uh, I mean the banked register. Banked. 
uh, yeah, when, when you uh, switch the context and uh, yeah. I mean the privileged mode, uh, the, the same bank, uh, some register will be banked. Um, I didn't look into that. Okay. But I guess it depends on your implementation. Uh, okay. And yeah, I, I can change to the next question. That, uh, uh, you have mentioned that there are uh, compressed uh, instructions yeah. uh, compared with the sum mode. So this is a uh, dynamic change. Uh, like uh, in ARM, we have a BLX. Uh, but in risk v It's it, implicit. It's, uh, yeah, it can directly decode. You don't need to change between modes. Like you saw uh, in the shell code, for example, I presented mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, <laughs> uh, that you have instructions which are two byte in size and instructions which are four byte in size, and you don't need an instruction in between. It just works like that. Okay, so uh, it's implicit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, time's up. Thanks a lot for listening. And if you have more questions, come and talk to me. I'm happy to talk about those topics.